You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. I have uh, John Strzelecki. He's the best-selling author of The Cafe on the Edge of the World, which I'm about uh, halfway through. It's a very interesting little book. Um, so, John, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invite, Richard. Thanks for doing your show, too. Yeah, no problem. Uh, tell me about uh, your background. What um, what have you been working on and doing the past however many decades? And, and then I want to ask you what led to uh, the creation of this book. Yeah, I, you know, I've been fascinated by the human experience for about as long as I can remember. Uh, I remember being a kid and sort of looking out at the adult world and thinking to myself, huh, so the strategy seems to be that you go to school for a really long time, and then you eventually get a job that you don't really like at all. And then you do that until you're 65, and then you get to do the fun stuff. And uh, even as like a little kid, I was aware that something just seemed slightly off with that theory. And then I found myself asking kind of unusual questions in my head, like, well, wait, why do we exist as, as at all? Like, why does a human even exist? And uh, so I, I thought I was the only person asking these questions. Uh, I was certainly the only little kid I knew asking these questions. But eventually I got to a point as an adult where I could start embarking on these sort of adventures and looking for connections from other fields of interest. And uh, so I'm fascinated by the human experience and how we optimize this gift of life. So what has that led you to in your life and how did it lead to the uh, writing of the book? Yeah, so in part it led to, I mean, I kind of followed the, the path. So I didn't know a different way to look at it. I, I was like, well, I'll sort of follow the path that most people are following. But then at some point I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to diverge off it. And so in my early 30s, I left everything behind, a very successful career, uh, and went to go backpack around the world to see the world and to experience other cultures and see animals of the planet, which is something I dreamed of since I was a little kid. And when I did that, it opened up a whole flood of, of interesting ideas and thoughts uh, and awarenesses, such as why is it that we actually typically will work until we're about 65 years old? That's kind of the path. And then try and do the fun stuff as opposed to, well, wait, when we're younger and we're more physically able, that seems like the time to go and do some of these fascinating things. And so I found myself asking these questions, uh, asking some of the bigger philosophical questions of life, like, why are we here? Why am I here in particular as a human? And when I came back from this experience of traveling around the world in my early 30s, I had a stream of conscious typing experience, which lasted for about 21 days. And that became the little book that you're talking about, The Cafe on the Edge of the World. And so I embarked on that path for a while. And fast forward to now, it's in 43 languages. And uh, it's been, uh, you know, bestseller of the year seven times in Europe, and it's being turned into a movie. And one of the big takeaways for me was, huh, this is actually a better path. Like following something that you love to do, that you're excited about, gets you farther in life. Well, what do you mean stream of consciousness? Do you mean like you just started writing and it just came out of you? Or what was the writing experience like? Yeah, very much like that. Something inside of me said, sit down and start typing. Uh, and so I did. And I was in this wonderfully open place. I don't know if you're an adventure traveler or kind of out there doing that kind of thing. But when you're in a foreign country where you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, you really have to rely on your instincts for even the most basic of things. And so it kind of opens up a piece of your uh, awareness, a piece of your brain functionality that I don't think typically is very open in our everyday lives, in our mainstream existence. And so when I had this sense that something was saying, sit down and type, I followed that and sat down and typed. And my wife actually asked me, she's like, what the, about day five? She was like, what exactly are you doing? And I said, I really don't know, but something inside of me is saying, sit down and type. And so I'm just going to do that. And so it did. It lasted for 21 days. It felt like it was coming from somewhere else through me onto the pages. And when I got done at the end of 21 days, it felt like whatever was flowing through me was, was complete. And uh, so I waited a couple of days. I printed it out and finally read it about seven days later. And it looked like a book and felt like a book. And so it became a book. And uh, it, it was fascinating because the very, my wife said, you know, like, what do you expect to, to happen? I said, I don't know. But if even one person reads it and it inspires them in some way, like the whole thing will be a raging success for me. And the very first person ever to read the completed manuscript uh, was a magazine editor. And the opening words that she said to me uh, when we sat together for the first time was, this little book has changed my life. 
And so that was a really good clue from the universe that I was, I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I was on the right path. Yeah, no, that's really good. <laughs> if your editor says that, that's a good, uh, a good start. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. What's uh, actually, well, that brings to mind, um, was there much editing done since your editor liked it so much? I would think some authors, like the, you know, the editors like edit everything and some of them maybe not so much, but maybe your book was so impactful and it was barely edited. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, the, so that was the editor of a magazine. It wasn't my editor of the actual book uh, for publication. But the process, yeah, as an author, you have to be kind of careful. As I was going through the process of selling the rights to the book, uh, I had editors who said to me, well, John, there's three questions in this book. You know, why are you here? Do you fear death? And are you fulfilled? And we like the story. Could there just be two questions? <laughs> and so I was like, well, I'm kind of getting this amazingly good response from people about it. So the answer is not really like, let's just stay with what seems to be working. So I think as an author, you have to learn to trust that intuition. And that's just not as an author. I think in life in general, if you learn to tap into your deep intuition, you're, you tend to be on paths that work out a lot better. Constructive feedback yeah. is great. But at the end of the day, you got to make your own call. Right, right. How much of this is a, a personal story? Or if not, you know, those three questions, like what was your experience of coming up with the questions? And then as you were writing, thinking about them yourself, if you did. Yeah. So that first question, why are you here? Right. And so we asked that on a personal basis. Why am I here? That was something, like I said, that I had been pondering since I was a kid. And as a kid, I couldn't quite put it into the context of the whole human experience. But it, I was always struck by the fact that when we start to play a game, like when, like say your friends say, hey, I've got this new game. And whether it's a video game or something else, one of the very first questions we ask is, well, kind of what are the rules and how do you win? And yet, if you think of life in that context, there really isn't a rule book and there's not a lot of sort of awareness that you get going through your typical life experience, school experience to figure out how you actually win. And so that to me is one of the biggest and most important questions when we get this game of life and the chance to live it, that we can ask, why am I here? And that sort of becomes our North Star, our guiding point for the decisions that we'll make along the way. What am I going to study? Where do I want to live? Um, what type of people do I want to hang out with? What interests me? And therefore, what am I interested in listening to podcasts about or et cetera? But I went through my entire education experience and never had anybody ask me that question. So I find that fascinating in the context of the great human experience that we have. What did your wife think about it when you finished it? Did she read it or was she like, eh? Yeah, I mean, she read it. And uh, I think that as she saw the response from readers, and the way in which it was it was catching on, I think then she was like, okay, like this is clearly your thing. This is clearly your path. And uh, so we're just about to head off an immediate tour now. We're heading off to Europe to do a 21-day tour and she'll be with me. My daughter will be with me. And so, yeah, they sort of see that other side of me because they see me at home and which that's just me doing my thing. And then they also see this other side of me, which is more on the philosophical side uh, because, you know, the, you asked about the three questions in the book. The second question is, do you fear death? And that's not your typical everyday conversation starter. Uh, but yeah, if you sort of look at the way in which people go through their lives and why they suffer maybe from depression and suffer from severe anxiety, I, in my experience, people actually don't fear dying. The actual act of dying is not what they fear. What they fear is getting to the end of their life and realizing that they haven't really lived the life that they wanted to live. So that brings up a really interesting question. Are they identifying the life that they want to live through their cognitive human experience? Or are we actually hardwired to some degree with an awareness of what is our path? What is the life that we most want to live even before we arrive in the physical form? And so is it discomfort with the fact that the path we're on is not the path that we actually want to be walking? And so these are the types of things that I think about all the time and that help me guide my own life in uh, through these types of podcasts. The writing that I do hopefully help people uh, walk the path that is uniquely theirs. Yeah, I don't know the answer yet because I haven't finished the book. How do um, religious people react to the idea of reading it versus uh, people, let's say, that are hardcore atheists? Do you <laughs> both assume that the book will go one way or the other? Yeah, it's kind of a bag. I find that people who are open-minded, whether they have deep religious beliefs or whether they're just convinced there's nothing else, it's sort of, yeah, people who are open-minded in either of those categories get something out of it. There is a really fascinating question that comes out of that very concept that you just talked about because if you if you look at the way the human experience works and again a lot of people are very very driven unfortunately by their fears and those fears keep them from living the life that they want to live and therefore they do have this fear of death as you look at life there's really only two potential scenarios from the way that i can see number one is that yes there really is nothing before and there really is nothing after and statistically you're going to get about twenty eight thousand nine hundred days and then you're going to die 
And that's it. Like once you die, it's game over. You're just going to be dead and buried. And that's going to be a, all there is. And if that is truly the way that the human experience works, then you might as well be fearless in the way that you approach it. Cause when it's over, it's over on the flip side. If you're really uh, religious or if you have a different perception of the way the human experience works, maybe you think there's a heaven. Uh, maybe you think that you were in spirit form before you arrived. Now you get your 28,900 days, but when you die, you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to whatever else you arrive, interestingly enough, at the same conclusion, which is, well, I should be a lot less fearful as I'm going through this human experience. I might as well do the things that most call to me and even seek those things out as opposed to just letting life happen. And that brings you to the third question in the cafe book, which is, are you fulfilled? And I think that most people, when they allow themselves to connect with that, which is really their thing, they have a tremendous amount of fulfillment as they go through life. And that's whether it's, I just want to be a great parent and I want to spend my time with my kid more than I spend my time on other things, or whether it's, I want to build the next great entrepreneurial venture. But that's really cool when you think that that's based on my choice. And I choose that based on that question. Am I fulfilled? Interesting. So what kind of feedback have you gotten from readers that surprised you or delighted you? I mean, we get a ton of really emotional and beautiful letters, um, very often for people that are survivors of a major illness. So lots of cancer survivors. Um, who said, you know, I was really struggling with trying to find purpose in my life because here I'm dealing with this major illness. Uh, my life is on the line. I don't know how many days, weeks, months, years I have left. And there's something in the story that connects with them, this idea that there is, that there is a reason for your existence, that you have a genius within you. And part of the human experience is to allow that genius to come forth and live that genius. And that seems to give people a lot of comfort and hope. Uh, there's also some amazing stories one of the ones that just stands out to me is a young woman who waited in line two and a half hours to have her book signed. And she wanted to be the very last person in the line. And when she approached, uh, you know, I said, thank you so much. You, you waited so long uh, to stand in line. I'm so appreciative of that. I said, what brought you here tonight? And as she slid the book across the table, I could tell that she had her wrist bandaged and she had uh, tried to commit suicide. And she said, I just wanted to come here today because I wanted you to know that that book is why I'm still here on the planet. Right. And so those are the kind of things that just, I mean, it, it humbles you in tremendous ways. And it makes me realize, and this is probably the thing that I struggled with most when I was younger. I thought I was the only, buddy, only person asking these questions. I thought I was the only person kind of struggling with the human experience. And you realize as you're out there that, no, that's not the case. It's just, it's not a conversation topic that we talk about a ton. Yeah, no, that's crazy. So how have these uh, the experiences with your readers and their comments and feedback, how has it shaped you and changed you, you think, changed your thinking? Yeah, it constantly, I'm constantly learning and trying to adapt to what I hear and, and then apply it to the next level of things that I can share with readers. As an example, I had a guy, another guy, uh, this was up in Canada. He waited in line for a long time and he slid a copy of a book that I wrote called The Big Five for Life across the table. And he said, I wanted you to know that I'm a father of four children and I was going to take my life uh, because I lost my business, went bankrupt. I felt so bad about my ability to provide for my family. I felt bad about who I was as a man. And my best friend gave me this book. And he said, I'm here today because he gave me that book. And he was crying. I started crying. We started talking. And just that story of the way that he was struggling because he had failed at a business then drove me to write something in the sequel to the cafe book. And part of that was research I did. And this is what's an example of I find little facts and then they make me really think about the human experience in a different way. And then I write about it. So this concept of live until you're 65 and then do the fun stuff. Like one out, of five, one out of five men doesn't make it to 65, like statistically. And that's not something that anybody seems to be talking about. So if that's the master blaster plan and you're a guy, one out of five of you isn't even going to get there. So that's worth to me rethinking, wait a minute, what, what am I buying into? What is the plan that I've subscribed to? And is that really the plan that I want to continue to subscribe to? Um, another, somebody had recommended to me, I don't know if you've ever read a book, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, yeah, I did read it. Yeah, it was very good. Unbelievable book, right? And so he, so here he was a psychiatrist uh, who was imprisoned in World War II in the camps. And he wrote this amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning because when he was a prisoner, he was also a psychiatrist at the same time he was a prisoner. And when he thought about the experience and asked himself, why did some people survive and some people didn't, he, he boiled it down to two main things. One was that people who survived um, were able to identify and visualize a time when they were not a prisoner. Like they could still envision that and they could hang on to that mentally 
he also felt that people didn't make it out of the experience because there was no defined end date that people had known it's going to be absolutely horrible. It's going to be just God awful for 10 years, but on 10 years and one day you walk out that he thought more people would have walked out. And then, so I read this book and that's unbelievably profound and it's such a moving story. And then I ask myself, so what does that mean for the rest of us in our human experience? Well, you know, so many times when we're in the midst of our frustrations, our stresses, our depression, it's because we don't have a defined end date. Like when is this situation going to change? And so the simple act of drawing a line in the sand and saying, on this date, I'm going to do something different, dramatically changes our brain chemistry in the way in which we look at life. Our ability to visualize then that thing that we're going to do because we drew the line in the sand changes how depressed we feel. It changes the way that we approach a Monday morning. So I'm fascinated by these different fields of interest and the way that we can apply them to living the game of life in a way that actually is satisfying. How much of the story was um, literally your personal experience? I mean, did you drive and get lost and end up in a cafe where you know you were asked these amazing questions, or like you know what, again, what part of the story actually happened to you, or is it just completely uh, you know your thoughts and you made it up? Yeah. So everything that I write, whether it's the the cafe on the edge of the world, the big five for life book, they are very much in large part based on my actual real life experiences. And then where appropriate to convey a particular point, um, I'll either use creative license or I will blend characters together. So if I've had two fascinating conversations from two different people, I see where that conversation taking place would be better served for the audience to have it be from one person, then I'll do that. Um, so yeah, I, the world is full of fascinating and interesting people as you know, because you do this really cool podcast and get to talk to lots of them, choose to talk to lots of them. And uh, so, yeah, with our, with our receptors open, there's a ton to learn from everybody. I actually, to that point, we were talking offline, but one of the really interesting ones that I loved of your podcast was the guy talking about the birds and how they navigate through this unbelievable system that they have inside of them. So then I ask myself the question, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for humanity? And for the people who who I'm sure everybody has listened to it, who are your followers, but if you haven't, there was like two unbelievably critical things that I picked up from that, that I applied in my life. One is that these birds are born with an initial guidance system. They've sort of got a blueprint, not sort of, they have a pretty significant blueprint that starts them off. Well, if birds have that, maybe we have that too. And what makes me think that's actually true is I noticed something which I call generational patterning, where a perfect example of this is someone whose father passes away when they're eight years old. Uh, it's a boy. And when he becomes a man, when his son is eight years old, he will demonstrate behavior associated with the father leaving. He will take a job out of state. He will arrange his time to be more at work or doing other activities. It's this crazy thing that happens where if we're not aware of it, we generationally pattern our behavior based on what we experienced when we were the eight-year-old boy. And this makes me think that, hey, maybe just like the birds, we have an initial pattern that's wired within us. Also like the birds, their main pattern actually forms on that first trip. So they go on that first trip and now they uh, they really wire it. They imprint what worked. So maybe that's the same way we can do too, that when we're out there in the real life after this initial blueprint, when we find something that works, if we imprint it, it makes it that much longer so that we can more easily do it the second time. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a good observation. I feel like we have the exact same um, predilections and inbuilt system, you know, of morals and ethics and, you know, all kinds of other things. So yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. I think it's um, instead of saying like we're separate and we're different and everything else is, you know, just a living machine, for instance, um, I always think we should go the other way. Like the fact that, again, you saw that birds have this inborn, inbuilt patterning. I think it's a much better assumption to assume we do too and then to, Think about that and explore it instead of saying, nah, because then it yeah. closes your mind off to that possibility. And why do that? How does that help? I, you? I totally agree with you. So I, I was doing an interview one time in Europe and uh, I was talking to a business leader and they were saying, well, can you give me an example of this? We we're talking about the way in which if you do employee recognition and rewards the right way, that you actually see a dramatic increase in productivity. And it's something that I wrote about in the Big Five for Life book. And he said, well, Uh, Okay, but the example you gave in your book was in the entertainment industry. And so and it's in the US. So can you give me an example in Germany? So I said, sure, here's an example from a company that I see in Germany. And he said, well, okay, that's in Germany, but that's in northern Germany and our company is in southern Germany. So can you? No, I kid you not. And then he went so far as to say, okay, but that's in this industry. We're in this industry. And I was like, dude, you're just asking for reasons why this can't work as opposed to saying, (laughs) what if? 
And, but the good thing, because you asked me, what do I learn from my interactions? So here's what I learned that if I'm willing to get rid of these types of filters and I can allow myself to say, well, if any other human on the planet has had this type of experience, whatever that is, or this type of aha moment or done or seen or experienced this spectacular thing, then I, even though I may look different, even though my background might be totally different, that I can learn from that too. And then to your point, what if I actually expand that even further? And what if I say any living organism on the planet that can do see or experience something that I have the capacity to learn from that and apply part of that to my own life? When we do that, the lens is so wide open. And that to me is like unlimited opportunity, again, to win the game of life. Yeah, no, that's really cool. It's rare. I see a lot of people, um, you know, either they have to because of career you know, let's say they're a scientist and they have to apply for grants in a certain way and they have advisors and they have to, you know, again, they're, they're kind of kept in a box of thinking. So some of them willingly think that way along those narrow lines and some of them want to come out of it, but they're all afraid to do that. I hear it over and over and over. Oh, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on this or, uh, you know, it, it depends. Everything is, every, every situation is unique or, you know, this is anecdotal or that kind of stuff. But I, again, I hear a lot of resistance to speculation is what I'd call it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, so you're a guy obviously who brings on people with unbelievably different backgrounds. So were you always wired that way? Did you have a defining moment where you said, wait a minute, like I can learn from anybody. What was, what's the reason for you as a human? Yeah. I just, uh, I wanted to go deeper on certain subjects. Like when I first started, I, I was interested in cryptocurrency. So a friend of mine encouraged me. He's like, you know, why don't you just interview people and ask them questions? You're always asking questions anyway. So so I started with that and I just felt really, really great and really excited about it. It was like a thrill. It was like a drug learning from people. And I kept doing it more and more. And then I was like, all right, uh, you know, I don't know, AI, I want to learn about that or quantum computing or, you know, I, I had thyroid cancer five years ago. So I'm like, all right, I better learn about that, you know, to help myself. And um, so just that's been the journey. It was just, I see something I want to learn more about or I see an interview or an article and I'm like, I know there's a lot more there. I want to ask the questions I want to ask. So I go after the person and, and talk to them. And it's a much richer experience. Like, like someone reading your book, that's the goal here is if they read the book and then they listen to this interview, they'll probably get a lot more out of the book even so because they've heard you and they hear the things that maybe the book doesn't cover because it can't, you know? Absolutely. So we were talking uh, before about some of the emotional struggles that people have and you were saying people have trouble bringing out of that box. The biggest thing I often see is a fear. So did you have fear that when you started this, wait a minute, I'm not an expert in X, Y, Z. I qualified to do this. Or did you just leap in with both feet, you know, unabashed or what was it like for you emotionally when you were going to go through it? Oh, I just, um, it, you know, if I'm interested in the subject, I don't worry. Like I, on some of them, I don't need any preparation because look, as long as I am truly interested and I can be interested in almost anything for at least 30, 40 minutes, then it's a good interview. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like yeah. if the person responds, if they're interested and excited and, and all that, then we have a great conversation, but it could be about anything. You know, the okay. only time it's, it's not good is if it's, you know, again, I truly don't care, but I don't do interviews. I don't care about it. I do. I, I talk to people I want to learn from and want to learn about. And as long as the person's willing to engage, we have a great call. Yeah. So that's, that's how I characterize it. Well, and I think, I mean, it comes, clearly it comes through in the podcast that you are passionate about this and you were talking how it makes you smile. This goes to me back to this, are we imprinted with some sort of a guidance system on life? And there are no doubt certain things that make each of us individually smile. So what makes me smile may not be the same thing that makes you smile or 10 other people smile, but there is something in each of us that we love to do that gets us fired up, that just genuinely makes us feel chemically different. And I do wonder if that is part of the wiring that maybe before we're actually born, that there is an element of choice that comes into it that says, this is what you're going to be jumping into for these 28,900 days. I don't know, but it's fascinating to me. And it gets even more fascinating as we start to explore what I call the cosmic algorithm the universe. And that is what are the underlying aspects that are happening behind the scenes that seem to dictate whether or not we go left or go right in our life. And I'll give you a perfect example of, of one of these, which is, it seems to me that the universe, God, the algorithm, whatever you want to call it, because I can't say that I know for sure what it is, 
is not just listening, but it's actually watching us. And so if I sit at my desk for 12 hours a day doing a job that I really don't like, then the algorithm looks and says, well, I don't know, that guy, John, I mean, he must love that thing that he's doing. I don't know why he's sitting at that desk all day. Uh, it's kind of cramping his back. You know, he's, he's not drinking enough water. Um, he's, he seems like he's kind of cranky when he gets up from it. But man, oh man, he spends 10 to 12 hours a day on that. He misses his, his baseball game and all the rest of this. So, and he loves the sun, so you'd think he'd be at the baseball game. So what is so important to him at this desk, it must be the most important thing to him. It must make him the most happy. And therefore, I will give him even more of that. And this is really fascinating me on so many levels because I've seen it play out not just in my life, but in countless other lives when I've talked to people that the minute you take a step in the direction that you want to go and you start demonstrating it's almost like a homing beacon kicks off to the algorithm that says, oh, this is what you're actually interested in. And we know that from a technical perspective that this stuff exists all the time in coding. In Google, and I type in uh, purple cows with polka dots, the next thing you know, I'm going to be getting articles about that. I'm going to be getting ads for that. And it seems to me that life and the underlying algorithm works very similarly. And then when we think, okay, well, what does that mean for my life? Well, what I'm demonstrating every day then becomes a factor in the way in which I get to live my life because the surrounding things that come my way are tied to that. So you see people um, when they start to think about what they really want and start to do it, even in the smallest ways, they light up inside. Is that a way to put it? It's beyond that they light up inside. There's certainly that. And the, someone who's lit uh, in a good sort of way, someone who's lighting up because they glow because they're doing something they love tend to attract like-minded people. It's sort of the equivalent of like, well, I'm thinking about doing something has a certain amount of energy to it. But if you say, no, I'm actually, uh, you know, in July, on July 7th, I'm grabbing my backpack and I'm going to go backpack to Thailand. People are much more like, oh, I want to get on board that train. Like, here's the things I know about Thailand, the rest of that. But it seems to be that when we actually make that commitment and we start stepping in that direction, that we are then more likely to meet someone who has just been to Thailand. Uh, or if you're starting an entrepreneurial venture in the telecom space, and you start taking action towards it, that there's that coincidence that just happens where you meet the person, somebody calls you, haven't talked to in 15 years from college, you tell them what you're doing, unbelievable, like they're actually working in the same field. So it seems more than just coincidence, because it happens so often, so frequently, and so much more profoundly when it's something that you actually really care about, as opposed to just something. Hmm. Interesting. Have you done any coaching surrounding the books? Or like, what's your relationship with readers and with with people how i mean has this become a business for you or you know what do you do to live your life yeah well i mean so the the first book that you mentioned the cafe on the edge of the world like i said it's in 43 languages and it's sold over 4 million copies and it's being turned into a movie so uh from a oh, nice. from a business perspective that has more than covered my i'm a pretty basic guy to begin with to be honest with you richard i'm a shorts and t-shirt kind of guy to begin with um but that's certainly more than covered it but then in addition, to that, probably the most recurring question I got was, okay, so I really like this idea of looking at the game of life and saying, how do I win? And the most important question to ask is, what is victory for you individually? Like, what do you want to do, see your experience in your lifetime by the time you die so that you look back over it and say, that was fantastic. And people really often struggle with figuring that out. And so I did at one point about 14 years ago, I created a method that would enable people to figure that out. And so I personally don't teach it anymore. I have different coaches around the world who teach it. Um, but that's been a really gratifying, unexpected uh, part of what's happened. And that actually ties to your question. It was entirely based on people saying to readers, saying to me, can you help do this? And uh, so, yeah, it's been a fascinating piece of it. But no, at the moment, the big focus for me is uh, continues to be on the books and uh, working on the movie project. Well, that's cool. I guess immediately I'm thinking, like, who's going to be the person in the cafe? Who's going to be the actors in the movie? But. I guess yeah. that'll come out when it comes out. Well, it'll come out when it'll come out. But I will say there's another piece of this, which actually ties into what we were just talking about that I'll give as another example. So when, when I started to get approached by producers about the film rights, I was approached by a number of different people and like they knew the numbers. They knew that, okay, this book has sold, you know, X number of million copies. And uh, so the metrics were there for why it would be a good person to turn into a film. But what they really, really connected to, they actually came to a signing and they saw the people and they saw the emotion of the people and they saw the way in which people connected to the story on a deep personal level. And I think that's really important because as you're thinking about, oh, I'd like to walk this path in my life and does it light my fire or does it not? 
at the end of the day, what connects your purpose to your success in life from a financial perspective, based on my experience and what I've seen with others, is the degree to which people can sense that this is actually the thing that lights your fire. Do you genuinely care about it? Are you excited about it? Without that, it's really hard for people to get excited. So for the movie project, have they not seen the fans so excited in telling these passionate stories about the way the book connected with them? I don't think they'd have bought it, even if it had sold 4 million copies. Interesting. Um, so I don't know what's, well, I mean, you're working on the movie and all that's very important. You've helped a lot of people, but do you feel a need for a next? Or, I mean, you know, you sound like you still have quite a ways to go, hopefully. Uh, what, what's next? Or are you content and, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about life is just about the time you think you got it figured out, it changes. You, you get older or you add another variable. So, you know, I, I wrote the first cafe book and I was at that point in my life where I was in my early 30s. And then I had a child that changed everything dramatically. In the sequel book, the second book in the cafe series, I talk about some of that experiences. Um, I wrote another book which hasn't come out yet here in the States, but it's uh, also in the cafe series. I was really struggling with turning older. I turned 50 and just this idea of I would not be able to ever again be the 25-year-old single backpacker wandering the world carefree that I could never be 25 again. Like that just hit me super hard. And so I didn't expect to deal with aging and struggles in the way that I did. So I find that at each phase of life, there's always something different to be asking interesting questions about. Uh, my father passed away. Uh, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. And that experience of watching your loved ones pass um, really brings to mind this question of the game of life. So listen, your 28,900 days are ticking away, whether you are aware of it, whether you're planning for it, whether you're consciously choosing good things and fun things and interesting things to do or not. And generationally, I think there's something very powerful when I was a kid, my dad used to take me on these trips and it was him and his cousins who were all about his age or even a little bit older and then me, just the kid. And it struck me, Richard, that everybody who is in that van is gone except for me. Mm-hmm. And that means I'm next on the depth chart. <laughs> I don't plan on kicking it anytime soon. And I hope I'm around for a long time, but I am next on the depth chart. And that just changes your life when you start thinking about these types of things. So yeah, I don't think I'm ever going to be done asking these questions about life. And I do know that as you get older, at least it seems like it when I talk to people, that it becomes less about you getting to do, see, and experience and more about doing your very best to pass along what you've experienced so that the next generation or two generations down can hopefully learn from something that you got figured out while you were on this planet. And uh, so I think that's a bigger and bigger piece of what I do, too. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, so right, your books are your learnings and part of your legacy, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How old is your child? Uh, She's 14. Oh, okay. So has she read the cafe books? Does she like them? Or is she like, is this stupid? Or how does she react to them? <laughs> yeah, so the the new book that I just wrote, which I'm actually going to Europe for, again, it hasn't come out in the States yet, but I'll be I'm going to Europe for this 20 tour. Um, whenever I write a book and I feel it's done and I'm like meticulous about editing, so I'll go through it a dozen times until I'm happy with every sentence. But uh, whenever I feel it's to that point and done, I'll ask 10 people who I really trust to give me really critical feedback to read it. And so it was really super fun talking about how life changes. So this, the main character in this book is a 15 year old young girl who come, who's struggling with so much of what life is like at 15. And so I asked my daughter if she wanted to be one of my 10 focus group readers and she did. And that was just such a cool experience to have my kid who I have this really, we have a really wonderful relationship to be one of those people giving me feedback. And, you know, I wanted her to know that I trusted her opinion and I totally do. Um, And also as a parent, I think you do your best to share these kind of things, these life wisdom moments with your kids. But sometimes it's not the best to say, let's talk about X, Y, Z. Sometimes it's you plant a little seed. And then a month later, or six months later, you have a conversation about the thing that you planted a seed on. And uh, so, yeah, we've had some really cool conversations from that story that really came about because she said, yeah, I'll be, I'll be one of these focus group readers. One of which was I talk in that book about the struggles that we experience as humans with giving up because we'll take on a new thing. And we're like super fired up about it at the start. But if you notice the pattern of learning, there's some, there's a very predictable pattern of learning. So we take on something because we're excited about it. We start and very quickly realize the path to mastery is going to take a while. Like you want to learn to play guitar? That is not going to happen in four days. And in our current era where we're so used to a TikTok video ending in 18 seconds, it's even more pronounced. And so one of the things I talk about in that book is that 
listen, you're going to go through these series, which are very, very defined series of things. But if you stick with it, here's the good things that happen along the way. And I'm so delighted to say that like you, uh, like after she had read it, then about two months later, she picked up ukulele and she's now a really good ukulele player. And I think it's in part because she saw that this is the way the human brain works when it comes to learning. And so she didn't get frustrated. She didn't give up along the way. I'm glad she had a good reaction to it instead of saying, Meh, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good sign. Yeah. Did, did she feel like uh, you cap, you captured how she experiences things or did she tell you like, oh yeah, you really nailed it or, or how did she express it to you? Yeah. I, I don't think she uh, was that demonstrative. She, she liked it and she's like, yeah, I think like, cause I always ask people like, what's the part that really connected? I, did I totally miss it on a particular part. So there was no feedback that I totally missed it. Um, and she thought that there were certain parts, definitely that one about the learning. And then there's another piece in there called the, the fast forward game, which is looking at the moments you're at in life and saying, and I know this sounds so basic, but it's like, if nobody teaches us this along the way, then we don't know it. And so if you look at the decisions you're making right now and you play the fast forward game and you say, well, where will that take me? What path will that lead me down six months from now, a year from now? It's a really easy method to see if you're going to end up in a place that you want to be. Or if you're going to end up in a place that is actually out of sync with the life that you want to live and therefore not really winning the game of life. And so that one connected with her as well. You talked about a a 14 point uh, heuristic or an algorithm to help you find your purpose or your calling. Yeah, I know know you can't share all 14, but can you share maybe like one or two to start people on the path? And then, you know, can we point them to some resources so they can continue if they want to? Sure, absolutely. So the first thing I would say to someone who is saying, you know what? I know I don't, I'm no, I know that I'm not where I want to be and I'm struggling to figure out where that actually is. Um, a couple of things leap out. The first is something that hit me so hard when I realized it um, because I had struggled with my own challenges of confidence and the rest of that when I was younger. And so first of all, take this simple uh, concept to heart that every expert, no matter what they become an expert, no matter how unbelievable the accolades are that they get as an expert starts off knowing nothing about what they became an expert in. And this is tremendously empowering when you let that one sink in, because it means that no matter where you are at your growth process in life, in whatever area that is of interest to you, everybody else started off at zero also, and you can progress dramatically. You can become an expert in that and you can live that life if you want to. So that'd be the first sort of level setting thing that I'd like. I'd I'd feel really great if somebody listened to that and said, okay, wow, that's kind of comforting. It's not that bad that I don't know yet everything that I need to know. Um, The second thing I would say is that every human that I've ever interacted with over the years, thousands of them, when I used to teach the courses and the ones that I've interacted with from other coaches who have taught it, when they walk into an experience of figuring out what they most want to do with their life, they actually, in their unconscious mind, already know. And so the trick is to really peel back layers of you can't do this, you have to do this, you should do this, to get to the point where you can actually unveil and release what's already inside your head. So as an example of some of the exercises that we take people through, my goal is to keep it super simple, super non-challenging for the unconscious mind because that's just puts up resistance. So it's a very basic example. If Richard, I gave you $300 and I said, you can spend it on anything you want. I would ask you, where would you spend it and why? And by the way, just as a, an example of the way in which we can help our unconscious mind and our brain move in the right direction, you cannot spend it on an obligation. So you can't use it to pay a bill. You can't pay your rent, any of that stuff. And as a matter of fact, if you override me and you say, no, I really am going to pay that bill, then A, you will lose the $300 and the obligation that you're trying to pay is going to dump. So by doing that, we actually activate a piece of our brain in a different way than if we allow that variable to be in place. Because our mind will be like, no, I just some people will be like, I just want to pay that bill. But then further fascinating is once you've closed that door and now you've got the brain really working on this field of pure potential, if you say, well, what would you spend the $300 on and why? If I listen for five minutes to someone's answer, and we can do it real time with a different question if you want, it is amazing the information that comes out of someone's unconscious. So for example, here's the type of clues that I look for. Are you spending it on one item or are you spending it on multiple items? Are you spending it on an experience or are you spending it on a thing that you get to see time and time again? Are you spending it on something for yourself or are you spending it on something for others? Are you spending on something that you're going to do now or something that you're going to do in the future? So all of these things provide clues from the unconscious mind about the life that you most want to live and the things that you find most fascinating in terms of the do-see or experience list. 
So that is a really simple example of one that literally in five minutes, I learned so much about somebody. I've had spouses sit next to each other. And after two of these exercises, they're like, I did not know that about you. <laughs> and I can, no, I can get it in five minutes from people. Any interesting answers? I mean, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of interesting ones, but any that jump out at you that you remember? Well, one of the cool things, yes. So one of the cool things that we look for is pattern recognition because the unconscious can't speak to you in the same way that you and I are talking. So the unconscious, it's not going to just be like, hey, Richard, um, that thing you're looking for is you want to do a podcast. But what it's going to do is give you clues. And this goes back to that whole algorithm at play between you, your unconscious mind, and the rest of the game of life. And so when you go through it, we have people like, listen, if you just keep getting the color blue, like write down blue, right? If you get the sensation of a wide open space and you have no idea why, but you're getting the sensation of a wide open space, write that down. Um, and as a way, as an example of the way in which this comes out, by the time you're done with the 13 steps, I might have seen blue four times in the first two exercises. And I picked up ocean somewhere down the line and then kayaking came up on the third one. You start to see a picture start to evolve. It's almost like in the old days when we had a very pixelated picture and it starts to develop finer and finer. And then finally, you can see what all the pixels were forming. That's what kind of happens as you move this information from the unconscious to the conscious mind. The picture just gets clearer and clearer until by the end, it's right there. It's right in front of you. And one of the most fascinating ones is I had someone who was just horribly unhappy in their job. And so as we were going through these different exercises and you started to get this pattern of space and openness, one of the examples is if I, the question is, what are your three favorite places to shop and why? And so you get all this data, all this information that flows from the unconscious. And this person was all about open space. It was all about great customer service. It was all about friendliness. And so I said, well, what, you know, what do you do for a living and, and where do you work? And they did a job that was basically the same job almost every single day. And they worked in a tiny little six foot by six foot cubicle in, a, in an office setting that had no windows. And it was just the complete opposite of the life that they wanted to be living, but they didn't really have that awareness of it. And so this is what's super cool, that if you can tap into this aspect of your life, you can uncover these patterns and you can start to then adjust things so you get to live the life that you want to live. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly, um, I don't know, can you give us just an extra detail with you on that? It, it, it doesn't seem really clear for some reason. I don't understand. So the clue or the thing is that you're looking for clues from the unconscious mind. And mm -hmm. these clues are going to come sometimes in very obvious things, but sometimes they're going to be not obvious. But as you go through 13 steps and you look for patterns and trends, you will start to then see patterns. And in these patterns are the answers. So as an example, maybe at the start for someone who ends up at, I want to go to Africa to see safari someday. At the beginning, when they're going through the exercises, it might just be Savannah. It might be sunshine. It might be animals. And as they progress through this, there's going to be a lion, there's going to be an elephant. And by the end, they're going to be like, holy cow, what I really want to do is I want to go to Africa. And again, this is just allowing yourself to understand the way in which your unconscious mind cannot communicate with you directly uh, through the spoken word, but can communicate with you. And going back to the cosmic algorithm of the universe, if you really want to tap into this in your everyday life, when you're walking by someone or you're at a social gathering and something inside of you says, wow, like I should talk to that person, but you have no idea why, allow yourself to walk up to them and say, you know, I know this is going to sound kind of crazy, but something inside says we're supposed to meet. Uh, my name's John. Oh, your name's Richard. Nice to meet you. Listen, I'm working on these five things that matter most to me more than anything else in my life and share some of the things that you're most excited about. And do not be surprised at all if this person can be an incredible conduit between where you're at and the life that you want to live. And you might be the conduit back for them for something that they care about as well. No, that's great. And that's bold of you to do that and say that to somebody and just, I'm sure they'd be like, you know, maybe they might think you're a weirdo, but it's good yeah, that well, you have the confidence and the boldness to do that. You know? Here's, here's the thing though. So if you look at life from the standpoint of I got 28,900 days, I have no time for the small talk thing. Right. And so if someone does think you're a weirdo, then you got to ask yourself, is that really the kind of conversation? Is, is that person going to end up in a really interesting conversation with me anyway? And the answer is probably no. But if you ask that type of question and they sort of perk up and they're like, well, that's really fascinating. Well, it's one of the greatest screening processes ever to figure out what's going to be an interesting conversation uh, at that dinner party or at that business function or whatever. Great. And the cool thing to go back to the bird story of the guy who followed the birds that trans, you know, to travel the world using these magnetic filters, mm -hmm. these, these internal like uh, functions within their DNA is that that first time they go, it's the roughest. But the second time they go and they imprint, it's exponentially easier because they lay down the groundwork. 
That happens exactly. with these types of conversations as well. So the first time you try it with someone, you might be a little, uh, yeah, right. But trust me, after you meet someone who is a direct conduit between the life that you want to be living uh, and where you're at right now, that second conversation, you're, you're going to be like, I cannot wait to jump into that conversation. I guess last question for now, are there any, uh, in the book, I think you call it a PFE, a perfect purpose for existing or for your yeah. existence. Um, any ones that you've heard that you can repeat that you thought were pretty cool or interesting? Yeah, so purpose existing, it answers the question, why am I here? And I, I mean, my own personal one is, yeah, I, I realized over the course of this experience of being an author, like that is part of my thing is to explore this game of life, these 28,900 days, do my best to find ways to make it a success and then impart those learnings uh, through the forms of podcasts or writings or whatever I do. I would say one of the other big ones is in the form of leadership, actually. I'm amazed at the number of people who have shared the cafe on the edge of the world with their teams and the realization that as an entrepreneur, they started a company, but they didn't even know why they started the company exactly. But mm-hmm. when they read the book and they're like, wait, that actually is my purpose. And so that is the reason that they started the company. And when they articulate that to their team and when they articulate to that to their customer, every invoice on every statement on their marketing materials, like this is why we exist. It is unbelievable how it changes their success. And we have very modern day examples of look at the success of Marvel, look at the success of Disney, Nike, these big brands. Why do they, why do they capture people's attention and energy? And maybe not every one of those is one that you love, but think of one that you do love. It's because their purpose and what they do is very much imparted every time you see their product and the way that they design it in the value that they give to you as a customer in the way that they design the packaging. And so again, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're thinking about your own life and the contributions you're going to make, asking that question, why am I here? And what is my purpose for existing? Awesome place to sort of build energy around it. So it's like a non cheesy mission statement, right? Yeah. It's, it's the complete opposite of cheesy. It's really the answer. It's asking that question. Why am I here? Like, okay, 28,900 days. What do I want to do while I'm here? It has all the power, all of the, the impact because it's genuine. It's not cheesy. Well, I'm just thinking about traditional mission statements, which are like, Bleh. yeah, I know. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> That's why totally. I, yeah. And That's why I contrasted really, it. <laughs> I know. And, and so, you know, it's a really interesting question to ask. Like, why do you think that they end up being gobbledygook? I think a lot of people hide behind corporate language. It's mm. like a comfort to them somehow. Just like um, a lot of people say, oh, well, it depends or. I'm not an expert. Yeah. I think people have been trained to be, unfortunately, more and more careful with language. Mm-hmm. So they use these as a shield, you know, caveats, uh, corporate language, non-descriptive type stuff. But it's yeah. all a shield to make sure that they don't get in trouble, I guess. Yeah. And so the issue with that is it's really hard to develop passion for what you do with that sort of generic terminology. Right. And yeah. so, you know, if, if you're going to build an amazing brand, Uh, If you're going to live an amazing life, then allow yourself to use the words that are genuine to you, genuine to your organization, and uh, sort of courageously move forth in that because people will find you. Again, if you're an adventure traveler and you were like, well, someone says, so so what's your purpose? And you're actually an adventure traveler. And you're like, well, I kind of like to get out a little bit, um, you know, just to be to be out there. Um, nature, you know, like that's sort of like what you're talking about that. Okay. We'll just gloss this over with something. So nothing that's not going to get anybody inspired to talk to you, nor to help you if your dream is to go to Africa. But if you say, you know what, I'm an adventure traveler at heart. And what I really want to do is go to Africa and strap on a backpack and go explore. People get that and they get excited about being a part of that. Yeah. It's more concrete, more specific, visceral, et cetera. Yeah. It's not cheesy. That's for sure. Well, excellent. John, it's been a really cool call. And, um, I'm enjoying the book. You know, I'm going through a little bit each night. I'm not just like binge reading the whole thing, but uh, it gives me a little bit of time to think about it in between each reading. But uh, it's excellent. It's a little book. I encourage people to read it. It's not hard to read at all. And I think it's uh, it's got a really compelling story. So thank you for all that you do and all that you've done and all that you're going to do in the future. Uh, it's good you're here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Right back at you. Appreciate what you're doing with your podcast and all the stuff that you do as well. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, and last thing. Um, so it's John Strzelecki. The book is what? The Cafe on the Edge of the World. Is that how? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And you mentioned uh, what's the book that's coming out? When will it come out in the U.S.? If ever, hopefully. And, and you just talked about one called The Big Five, I believe, as well. Yeah. So The Big Five for Life is a book that is out. And uh, so people can get that as well. And uh, it'll be the third book in the Cafe series will be the one that's coming out in the U.S. probably in the next year or so. Excellent. 
Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 